Welcome to Modern Art Blitz. I'm your host, Matt Gleason. My next guest, Kristen Marvel, just finished a show at Museum as Retail Space Mars Gallery in Aliso Village here in Southern California. Welcome to the show, Kristen. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Uh, great show down at Mars. Uh, how, uh, how much work was that putting together? Well, I, some of the work was done before I learned about the show, but basically six months worth of work to to do all the work for that show. Um, was it a lot of site-specific work? Quite a bit. Um, there are some sculptures that were made prior to the show that fit the theme of the show, which was about perception. And uh, so there was probably six months of honing in those pieces to fit that idea and to take fill the space, 6,000 square feet. Um, and the piece so we're looking at here? This piece is part of a piece called the Duet series, and my process has been for 30 years to carve styrofoam with a hot wire, so all of a sudden carving becomes a spontaneous event, um, which has slight historic significance since carving's never been very spontaneous. But it's like having a big cheese cutter that you can slide through styrofoam, and one of the effects it's also unique to that technique is that you get both the positive and negative side of every cut. So I tried to take advantage of that process and these pieces, the duet series, um, are pieces that come apart that basically show the, the interior cut that's on both sides. So, so that's where that piece came from. And and now this is the styrofoam hanging on the wall. This is resin on styrofoam. It hangs on the wall. That piece that you see is fairly large, like eight feet by eight feet, and hangs off the wall maybe three, three and a half feet. But, so but there was also like, a, a piece in there that was like a, like not a painting, but maybe a, a giant photograph? There's a, a photograph that's an exact replica, same scale as this, um, that hangs on the opposite wall. And it hung in my studio while I was working on this show, and a lot of people who know me only know me as a sculptor, and they would constantly perceive this photograph as if it was a sculpture. It looked, no, it was, and, it was one of the great, it fooled me. And so that was the whole concept about how do we perceive objects. So one is a two-dimensional object perceived as a three-dimensional object, and the other is the actual object itself. So that was part of the dialogue of the show. No, it was it was it was a great uh, one of the great illusions I've seen uh, uh, recently oh, in, in a gallery. Now, how long have you been? Are you a Los Angeles native? No, I grew up in Oregon, climbing mountains, skiing, that kind of thing, fishing. Why would you ever leave? It sounds uh, like paradise. because there's an art world. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that one in Oregon? It, it, it exists. <laughs> yeah, it exists in in New York or Los Angeles. It doesn't exist. How, how long have you been outside. in L.A.? I've been in L.A. thirty some years. Wow, you like it? So I do. I, th I find it challenging living here and, and I like it and you can drive to Mammoth and go skiing and you can drive up in the local mountains and go hiking fairly quickly. So Wrightwood's it has, closer. You can, yeah, you can ski there. Yeah. Two hours from the house. Yeah. Go skiing. So, so um, That's good. And, and, and you said you've been cutting styrofoam as long as you've been here? Yes. Wow. I, I learned about hot wires in graduate school so I went to graduate school at the University of Southern Illinois and one of, well, I guess my assistantship was working in a science lab because I had a science undergraduate background. And one of the people there pulled out wire to make a hot wire to cut some sponge foam. And I thought, wow, this really works because I'd been cutting styrofoam on a bandsaw. And of course, the limit on the bandsaw was the height of the bandsaw and the depth of the throat, which was 12 or so inches. So it really limited the scale. And then all of a sudden, I had a hot wire I could cut foam you know, you can buy foam at 16 feet long by four feet by four feet. So oh all of a sudden, God. you can work large and spontaneously. So wow. that was a big, uh, a is big this, progress. This is an installation shot here of your of your show. Right again. So the black sculpture is 12 feet high, um, carved out of foam. The surface is resin with graphite. So the graphite's mixed in a floral wax and applied to the surface. It gives it really nice metallic feeling. And then the piece to the left of it is uh, what I call a wall painting. They're technically reliefs. And that's resin on foam. But in fitting with the concept about how we perceive objects, it actually is a relief. So it has some three-dimensionality to it. 
and it has iridescent resins, so as the light changes, if there's a window or something. We were talking about that yesterday. The color actually. changes. Uh, so. We were talking about this. Okay, so you call it iridescent. It, we, I, I was thinking, what's the difference between pearlescent and iridescent? Well, I'm not sure technically. Oh, but, okay, okay. Uh, well, but see, I, I defer to the technical. Because I'm using, in some cases, pigments that call themselves pearlescents added to the resin, and some of them are called iridescent resins, and I'm not sure if technically that makes much of a difference, but the pearlescence is more on the white scale, and the iridescent things can be blues, greens, reds, things uh, like that. So okay, because so you I definitely think, had some tint. I think definitely that's the concept, is the pearlescence are more white. I did like the fact that as you, as you moved around the work, the, the color did change. Colors change very subtly, but they change, and in this particular gallery, it's all iridescent lighting, but if you had a, a natural light window behind, you'd see that the painting color would change as the light outside changed. Ah, as so, the day goes by. As the day goes by. As the sun by. moves, yeah, exactly. which basically, that's all of our light, the lighting source for all of us. Right. Now, is there an issue with archivability and styrofoam? None. These pieces are totally archival, indoors. That the styrofoam, the resins, all those things are archival inside. Outside, in direct sunlight, I think they would have a hard time over a long period of time that sunlight, UV light, tends to break down. Well, so would photographs and paintings, so, though, so it's not Right, like, exactly, know. anything, but I mean, and, and that was the breakthrough. I mean, people that know my early work was all translated to bronze casting, and so all these pieces would normally be bronze castings, which gets very expensive and hard to move around, and this show would take a forklift and some craning. And, and, and now yeah, there was so. one metal piece in the patio, though. There's one smaller bronze piece in this patio that was done. Was that solid you know, or hollow? It's hollow. Oh, okay. So okay. it's done in styrofoam, but a, a rubber mold's taken, and then uh, through the foundry process, you make a wax, invest the wax, cast it in bronze, weld it together. All right, well, so. let's, let's see more, because the, the show was extensive. I mean, Mars is a giant gallery if you've never been there. It's, it's just. Now, this was one of the smallest pieces in the show. So, again, this is about perception. I'm trying to, it's a little bit of a pushback about the preciousness of objects and how we've rejected that thought in the postmodern era. So, these are bronze castings that are plated with 24 karat gold, and then they're put on a little black pedestal with sand, black sand. And it's sort of a statement about um, how we see objects of value. And in this case, they're valuable because they're 24 karat gold. And this, as opposed to the form. As opposed, well, and the form's really ornate. So there's a, a you know, it, it's titled the uh, Artifact Series. And I wanted to play off the idea when you go to the museum and you see an artifact and it's a little gold piece that was found, you know, buried somewhere. And it's circa, you know, 2000 BC. And it's in its own little case with a little light on it. You look at it, you go, wow, that's the best thing in the whole museum, even though it's really tiny. So this was kind of an extension of that and trying to take back the preciousness of objects and the craftsmanship and object making. And so this is made originally in wax and then cast and plated. How, how many so, of those do you, did you make for the show? I there are three, uh, three pieces like this in the show. And is this the first time kind of playing with gold? Yes, yeah, the first time I've Put any kind of gold. Were you happy to? The, I, I thought that these pieces turned out great. I was really thrilled with them. I think they they really did what what I wanted them to do. And if you look at the surfaces, they're very ornate, um, and people are confused as to how they got made. So that's well, you know, gold gold peaked in 2010, so you <laughs> couldn't have done the show in 2010, right? Right, right now, well, it's taking a big dip. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So well, gold gold prices being what they are, this the value could go up regardless of the aesthetics. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, so, oh, okay, now this is one of the lit pieces. So this is an extension of light as perception, and this piece, again, was made as part of the duet series, so it's a three-dimensional wall sculpture with two white pieces that are anchored on the wall, and then they have programmable lights that are put on them on a random sort of fade cycle, and what happens is, because of the three-dimensionality, the shading becomes the opposite primary color, and all of a sudden, because you have two different light sources, you have this constant rotating color, and it's been programmed to rotate very slowly. So it becomes very experiential as opposed to just an observation of a wall sculpture, and somewhat reflects how we look at how we perceive things through light. Like if 
you look at photography, almost all photography is shot either early morning or late afternoon when there are great shadows created. So this is just creating its own shadow and then because you, you have multicolored lights, you, you can create these what are kind of beautiful things. But one of the sidelines about it is that it, when you observe the piece, the light, because it's on the wall behind it, it tends to flatten the whole surface out. You perceive it more as a painting than you do as, as a sculpture in a way. So that's kind of nice. And, and uh, I have to ask this. Yeah. I, I, you're not going to get out. You're not going to get out. Uh, you're not going to get off my show without me asking. Okay. If you have any working now uh, while you're working, uh, do you have any think thought or influence of uh, Clifford Still in your work? I see Clifford Still in your work. I can't. I mean, not. I know Clifford. I know his work. It's um, the, the jagged forms to me. It just it just seems like you're you're like I'm going to make this, you know, I'm going to take this off of this illusionistic space and make it its own thing. You're kind of out, out Cliffording Clifford's still there. Well, I guess that's nice to say. You know. Um, oh, I, 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 think, I, I totally mean it as a compliment. I, I don't, I, I don't, <laughs> if I wanted to insult you, I don't I'd just necessarily insult you, but... <laughs> think about. Um, Is he an influence? No. I no? Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think you're seeing it because of the color, and the color is relatively new to me, so I'd have to backtrack to get to Clifford still. But I think I am very interested in processes that are not repeatable, that are spontaneous. Like this is carved, again, hot wiring foam. I couldn't really repeat it, but I do have an idea where I'm going to go. And people ask me whether I draw forms, and I say no, but I do choreograph. It's like a choreographed dance with the wire to produce the forms. And, and then, you know, if if the wire is hot or cold, it'll cut in a different way, and the proportionality of the wire to the piece matters. So wow. the pieces are coming out, and to me, they're referential of nature and, and things that we see in nature. And then I've tried to manipulate it enough that we, you realize that I didn't just go find it in nature. I actually made it. So, nice. so nice. that's. And, and, and so. This, all this work from the show, including this, were 2016, 2017? Yes, with the exception, there's some very large sculptures um, that I don't think we have pictures of for today that were carved before I knew about the show. So they were carved probably in, in I don't know, 2010 or something, but they weren't, the surfaces weren't finished. Ah. So all those pieces got finished with an idea towards okay. this iridescent surface quality for this show. So Great, great, great. So, have, oh, okay, these were floating, correct? Right, so these are floating, and, and I think you know, as a modernist sculptor, I always say that, that, you know, the problem or the fight with modernist sculpture is always gravity, so you're always trying to either illusion your way off of it. So these things are actually hanging, and then they have projected light on them, and the, in this show, there's also uh, a video of light that shot, that shot on one of my pieces that took eight lights to program, and I can't very well have a show with eight lights, so it's hard to know where to put lights to, to actually have the lights physically in the, in the gallery space. So these are hanging above a pedestal, and the light the f that produce the color are buried in the pedestal, so you don't really see them, wow. and projected up onto these pieces. So and it's constantly changing. And they're constantly changing. So you really so you work with this so. theme, like, like you can't make the same piece twice, and this piece, as you look at it, it it's never the same thing it's twice. Never you know, technically, it's not supposed to come back to the same place twice. It's on back. Well, they're on random. They're on random. <laughs> Call numbers. that algorithm. Okay. So, so they're on different out. Well, um, while we've been talking about uh, three-dimensional space, um, yeah. my curatorial assistant, uh, Eliza Bejarano, has been sketching in two dimensions. You. So from the sketcher's seat, uh, Kristen Marvel, let's hold that up to the camera. <laughs> Get oh. out the glare. Oh, yeah. Wow. Out of the glare. Hey. Yeah. Pretty good. Pretty good. Hey. Uh, thank you that for being on the show. Here. Thank you for being on the show. Kristen Marvel.